Our gospel lesson comes to us from John chapter 6, verses 53 through 69. Listen now to what the Spirit is saying to the church. So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard word. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones who did not believe, and who was the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it's, uh, it's hard to believe that almost two years have come and gone since I first joined First Pres as a pastoral resident, but here we are. The last sermon of Nate's residency, the grand finale, the last episode. I'm sure live stream viewership is through the roof right now to see how the series will end. The exciting conclusion, kind of like the end of The Sopranos. <laughs> Just kidding, of course. I've never seen The Sopranos. <laughs> I want to say a big thank you to everyone who has gone out of their way to welcome me and the Self family to Greensboro and to say how thankful I am for the relationships I've made with many of you throughout my time here. The good news is that the Cell family is staying in Greensboro, so this is not goodbye. The time of my residency has overlapped with a time of great transition in this church. Sid left, left shortly after I began, and then Danny joined us, and now we are approaching the time of a new senior pastor. This time of transition has made me ask some big questions, not just about the future of First Presbyterian Church in Greensboro, but about the, the future of the church at large. You all know the trends by now. I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom. The main line's attendance has drastically declined. First Presbyterian Church's attendance has declined as well. Christendom is waning in America. Again, no surprise here for anyone who has been paying attention. And throughout my time here, I've heard various ideas and opinions of how to fix this. If we just moved the donuts and coffee here, or did this or that with the music, things would be better. If we just changed the worship time to 9.57 a.m., we could catch the most people before soccer practice, and if we served avocado toast during coffee hour, the millennials would be sure to show up. If any, everyone could just agree to wear blue jeans, we'd look more inviting. If our live stream featured um, pictures of puppies and kittens, that would boost viewership. And if Keith grew a mustache, we would be the number one church in town. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Keith for his leadership 
on this front. The most challenging comments I've heard are the assertions that if we stop talking about things from the pulpit that seem controversial or political, we would stop losing people. Or, alternatively, if we don't take a meaningful stand on controversial issues, we will most definitely lose people. It's hard to thread the needle on that one. But even as I poke fun at some of the suggestions and lift up the difficulty of the others, I want to affirm that I love that members of our church want our church to thrive and grow. That's a good and beautiful impulse. We could, we can, and we should continue to look at these types of things and ways that we can truly be warm and welcoming. They raise a very important question, however. How should the church exist in a world that seems to be rocking on its very foundations? The challenges before us are not easy. It is a hard thing to follow Jesus. It's a hard thing to be the church. This word is hard. Who can accept it, the disciples say in today's scripture lesson. And they no longer went about with him. Here we get a very honest response to the teachings of Jesus. Those who come to hear him either do not understand or do not believe in what he has to say. Some of them are offended by his words, and so they speak their minds. This is a hard word, they say. This is a hard teaching. Who in their right mind could believe this stuff? How could we get on board with this? This is offensive. What is this guy talking about? This word is hard to understand, and so they leave. And these are his disciples, mind you. Sometimes in the church, I think we don't often admit how hard scripture is to understand and how hard it is to follow Christ. Some of us preachers try to get up here and make it seem like everything is as clear as it could be. Sometimes we get the impression that the Bible is self-explanatory, that we can just open it and then it will all make sense. I have to be honest with you. Even after spending three years on a Master's of Divinity and now having spent five years in ordained ministry, I still find scripture difficult to understand. I often find that what Jesus says is tough to figure out, or even if I think I have it figured out, even harder to accept and follow. Like those who question in today's passage, I tend to read scripture and say, this word is hard. Who can accept it? I mean, look at the scripture passage we have today. Jesus starts talking about eating his body and drinking his blood, and that no one can come to him except through the Father. I never had a class on cannibalism in seminary. This is a hard thing to understand. And why is Jesus saying all these things in the first place, all these things that make people go away? That doesn't seem to be a good model for church growth. Jesus is terrible at marketing, and he says this kind of stuff all the time. I mean, listen to this. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Or, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Or, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maim than with two hands to go into hell. Or take our first scripture lesson. God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son, his only son, as a test. As a new father, I am telling you, I could not conceive of such a thing. I could not, I would not. This is a hard word. These teachings are difficult. People are offended. They leave. Why do some stay? Why do some go? What are we to do with scriptures like this? And what does it mean to be a church in these trying times when the God you profess to follow keeps saying these offensive things? Maybe I should rely on a rabbinic tradition that says you don't touch certain texts until you are at least 40 years old. That tradition says that until then, you just aren't ready for some scriptures yet. That buys me seven more years before I have to touch and teach on some of these texts. I haven't studied them enough. 
I haven't lived enough yet to tackle them. I kind of like that idea. But it still doesn't make for much of a marketing campaign. It's tough to draw in a crowd with teachings like these. And they no longer went about with him. And the main line continues to decline. So what then shall we do? This is a hard word. Who can accept it? One of my favorite novels is written by the author Wendell Berry. Just a little bit of a joke by this point about how much I love Wendell Berry. But some of our men in our church got together to read this book this last winter. And the story is about a man named J. Bear Crow. As a young man, J. Bear thinks that he is called to be a minister. And he starts reading scripture closely. And the more he reads it, the more confused he is. He goes to his seminary Greek professor for answers. He asks him about prayer and violence and a whole lot that doesn't seem to make sense in the Bible. There's a lot in scripture that is tough. His Greek professor looks at him kindly and he says, you have been given questions which cannot be given answers. You will have to live them out, perhaps a little at a time. And how long is that going to take, J. Bear asks. I don't know as long as you live, perhaps. That could be a long time. I will tell you a further mystery, he said. It may take longer. Scripture gives us questions that cannot be given easy answers. Following Jesus doesn't give us easy answers. We have to live them out, perhaps a little at a time. I'll share one thing that has been key to my understanding of Scripture, and that comes from St. Augustine, one of the earliest church leaders. I hope you will remember it. Augustine says that until we have understood scripture to build up love of God and neighbor, we have not understood it correctly. That's big time. Until the scriptures build up love of God and neighbor, we haven't understood them correctly. Who is this God? What does it mean to serve him? How do I love my neighbor? We don't get a formula. We have to wrestle. We have to live out the answers a little at a time. One of the reasons why I love long distance hiking so much is because I think it is a fitting metaphor to the faith journey. You set out on this journey in high hopes that it will lead to relaxing, beautiful, peaceful places. And then along the way, the bugs start biting. The climb gets hard. You ache. You sweat. You wonder why you're on this journey at all. And then, every once in a while, you'll catch the most beautiful sunset of your life. You'll stand on a peak, and you'll know that it was all worth it. You'll soak in this glimpse. Then you descend back down into the trail and sweat and curse and get eaten by bugs again until you get above the clouds on the next mountain. And then you see it all, it is all worth it. Repeat. Faith is like this. We read scripture and we don't understand it. We try to follow Jesus and it doesn't make sense. We catch a beautiful glimpse. Repeat. I could spend the rest of this sermon talking about how the author of the Gospel of John is probably talking about the Eucharist in this passage to explain its importance to a certain community almost a hundred years after Jesus' death and that what is happening in this weird text may be functioning symbolically. We could dissect this passage and put it in its historical time and place and context, and maybe I could throw around some Greek tenses to make it more interesting. I actually never found that interesting. But that isn't what I want us to think about today. I think it is okay to read passages like this and just be confused by them for a bit. Faith isn't a code to be cracked. It's something to live out a little at a time. The Gospel of John starts this way. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Again and again in John's Gospel, Jesus is referred to as the Word. This Word, this Jesus, is hard to understand. This is a hard word, we say. Who can accept him? The late, great Presbyterian minister Eugene Peter describes discipleship as a long obedience in the same direction. I really like that. 
What happens if we keep after these questions as a church, even in spite of the things we don't like or can't understand, even when the aesthetics or the politics or the music challenge us or when they offend us? I wish for my grand finale of a sermon I could offer you five points that would save the main line and bolster attendance, but I don't have that wisdom for you. I certainly have ideas that maybe could help, but I don't think that's the point. Jesus doesn't want a marketing campaign. In fact, I've come to believe that Jesus says these hard things precisely to encourage the non-committed members to take a hike, to leave. Jesus doesn't want a marketing campaign, but he does want faithfulness. That should be our guide and our rock for all we do as a church, for all the decisions we make, full stop. As our book of orders states, the church is called to be faithful even at the risk of losing its own life. And the fact of the matter is that following the word made flesh will inevitably lead us to difficult places and hard words that may make some turn away. If we faithfully try to engage the world and tackle the problems of our day, some may leave. Jesus worked on tackling the injustices of his day and it got him killed. And in our day, working to end the injustices of our time, it will not be easy. Taking on systemic racism and economic injustice, as I am convinced Christ would have us do, may alienate folks. Stewarding God's creation in the midst of a climate crisis will get pushback. Navigating a pandemic faithfully may, may alienate others. As we try to love our neighbors and the oppressed and the downtrodden and the refugee and the sick and the destitute and, the, and our enemies, we shouldn't be surprised that some may be offended and walk away. The truth is, that's just part of the business of following Christ. It's always been that way. He's a tough God to follow, after all. Ah, oh, well. You already know all of this. If you're still here, I'm preaching to the choir. You've already figured it out. The disciples who stick around know why it's all worth it. Peter says it for us. When Jesus turns to the twelve and asks, will you leave me also? Peter responds, Lord, to whom else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Peter doesn't know what Jesus means, but he does know who Jesus is. Peter has found that Jesus is trustworthy. Peter has found that sticking with Jesus through thick and thin, even when he doesn't understand him or agree with him or like what he has to say and struggles to follow him, that that is actually life itself. And Peter finds that with the church too. In the ups and downs and questions and frustrations of our faith, we may even realize that there is no one we would rather be with. There is no other Lord worth following. There are no other disciples you'd rather have by your side. If you are on the edge of walking away, my hope and prayer is that you won't. My prayer is that we all, all have a long obedience in the same direction. This word is hard, but he is full of love. Nothing can separate us from his love. May we continue to stick around and struggle and learn and love each other as we try to follow him. After all, to whom else could we go? This hard word is the Holy One of God. Amen.